And this is from Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46, where Jesus, now near death, in terrible, terrible agony, cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, or in our language, Eli, Eli, my God, my God. You finish the rest. Why have you forsaken me? Let's think for a, for a moment about just the physical, just the physics, just the just the human energy of that whole that whole thing. Jesus had been for days leading up to this point had been sleep deprived. I mean, he's got crowds all over him. He has to flee back to Bethany and then come into the temple. And I mean, the adrenaline and just the energy. And there's not a lot of time to, to uh, you know, I mean, he tries to go out. The disciples all just fall asleep on him. You know how tired everybody was. He's sweating blood. There's stress. And then he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And for all night... And all that day, he's being beaten, scourged, mocked, hauled into trials, very stressful situation, uh, all the way. So, so by the time Jesus was actually taken out to the place of the skull and nailed to that cross, he was already disfigured and tortured. I mean, he was a wreck of a human being. Okay. Now he's nailed on that cross and he's been there what? How many hours? Uh 3 4 5 going on 6 hours. If you've ever studied the the art of crucifixion, it's a it's a highly sophisticated form of torture where it's designed to not allow you to die quickly but to incrementally f- force death through strangling in your own uh, lung juices, so to speak. You die of suffocation. So here was Jesus, artfully put on that cross with that intent, and he'd been there all this time in the beating sun because uh, that's kind of what it's like over there. And He's uh, has no food, no drink, total pain, and he's got nine inch, uh, nine inch heavy spikes driven through uh, his extremities. Okay, and that's all that's holding him up. So for six hours, his body weight has been pulling down, f- crushing his diaphragm. I'm not trying to make this gory for for gory's sake, but but I'm just trying to I'm trying to get a handle on the state of Jesus. Okay, now. At that point in time, for someone to, what does it take in terms of, of energy and summonsing up, summoning up those last of the last of the last reserves of energy for a person in that situation to actually say more than a word or two, to actually speak out a sentence, so to speak, Eloi, Eloi. Lama sabachthani. I mean, you're not down there almost dead with no air, even getting that much to speak. It was, it, it was an amazing feat for Jesus to say that. Okay? I just want to kind of establish the physics of, of, and the physical aspect of getting that statement out into the, you know, with 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 any kind of volume that people heard and remembered and wrote down. Uh, It wasn't an accident. It was not an accident. You can't accidentally, you know, perform quite like that. Now, I want to back up in time a few hours earlier from this point. And I want to kind of introduce a conundrum here that maybe it's something, and and I want to just ask you to keep an open mind, okay? Because I'm going to say something that's very, very different from what I was brought up to believe and from what I know many 
thousands of people believe now, but which I believe to be the truth. And I want to, so I want to share it and just ask you to keep an open mind and, 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 uh, and then make your own judgment as to accurate or not. But in John 16th chapter, of course, we, we read this every year at the Lord's Supper, part, portions of this section where Jesus is talking to his disciples after dinner before they go out and before he was arrested. So I'm just taking a little snippet here. I want to, I want to focus on one point. In John 16 and verse 32, Jesus said, The time is coming and is already here when all of you will be scattered each of you to your own home, and I will be left all alone. Then he says, but I'm not really alone. I'm not really alone because the Father is with me. He said, you guys are going to leave me. It's going to look like I'm all alone, but I'm not all alone. The Father is with me. Then in John 17, in the next chapter, in verses 21 and 23, all of this would be beautiful and relevant to read, but for the sake of time, I'm centering on these two verses. Jesus is praying over the, uh, over the, the, the disciples, and he said, I pray that they may all be one. Father, may they be in us, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be one so that the world be will believe that you sent me. I gave them the same glory that you gave me so that they may be one just as you and I are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be completely one in order that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them as you love me. So he was asking the Father to make them completely one, just as he is completely one with the Father. Now, I think you can see where I'm going here. We have a math problem. Okay? If something is one, how do you unone something? How do you unone something that's one? And if by some means you know you can unone something, how do you then it's not one anymore? <laughs> okay? So here Jesus has been saying, knowing what was going to be happening to him, leading up. He says, I am one with you, and you are one. We are completely one. I want you to bring them into that oneness as well. If you manage to tear one apart, is it ever one again? Secondly, I want us to consider passages like these. They're, they're throughout Scripture, but I'm just pulling out a couple of, uh, for illustration purposes. Proverbs 15. That's an unlikely place to go for a for a, a uh, you know, Last Supper, Easter passage, but let's just look at it. He says in verse 3, the Lord sees what happens everywhere. He is watching us, whether we do good or evil. There's nothing that escapes God. Psalms 139, verse 7, where can I go to escape from you? Where can I get away from your presence? If I went up to heaven, you'd be there. If I lay down, in the world of the dead, you'd be there. If I flew away beyond the east or lived in the furthest place in the west, you would be there to lead me. You would be there to help me. I could ask the darkness to hide me or the light around me to turn into night. But even darkness is not dark for you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same. You created every part of me, and you put me together in my mother's womb. Now here's where here's where the 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 issue I think resides. Okay? We have at least I have always in my youth and and even into my adulthood 
uh, believed and was, was taught that God did turn his back. He cut himself off from Jesus. And there are thousands and thousands of people who believe that the Father cannot look at sin, that he will not look at sin, that the Father is righteous, he's pure from sin, and that that's why he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to deal with the sin because he would, and he's the righteous God, has to maintain the standard, and he's the, etc. I mean, you, you, we all know this. You've, you've either believed it or read it, or you, you understand that that is a, a very strong, powerful belief out there. So at this point, Jesus is feeling completely forsaken because, as, 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 we, as we would say, because all the sins of humanity were transferred to him on his shoulders at that time. And God, the Father, or God will not look at, tolerate, uh, or be in relationship with sin. Well, you see, the problem with that is the Bible seems to indicate just the opposite. If we just back up and take it, you know, without our, our presuppositions. I mean, uh, Jesus came, he said, and did. He came to hang out with sinners. Uh, you know, he, he, he absolutely scandalized the religious uh, elite of the day by seeking out sinners to go home with and have dinner. Of course, the religious elite showed up to just observe i'm sure with the you know when he would meet with the uh with these people and uh find fault but but that was but but jesus it was not only was he comfortable in the in in the proximity of sin he sought out the the people to redeem in eden adam and eve chose to reject god's authority they sinned they came to understand through that act disobedience and shame. They ran and hid. If God were a God that wouldn't, you know, that that did not uh, was not comfortable or or willing to interact with sinners, he had a perfect he had a perfect reason to just go his own way. They took off. Instead, he comes looking for them, calling for them, uh, make you know making sure the relationship stayed connected. You know, what we did at the beginning, what I did with you relative to the movies and you finishing and the point I, I made about how we tend to, how we can shorthand a larger body is something that is very common, uh, not only us, but it was, it was a common practice in the time of Jesus. Uh, especially in the synagogues, there was so much liturgy, and you know there was a there was a annual cycle through the Bible uh, where you had to, you had passages uh, each Sabbath from the law and from the prophets and from the from the wisdom, and um, and and people participate. It was the kind of thing like uh, we did, where you would start in the in the the, the 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 congregation responds even in the Anglican Church. If you go to the High Church in one of the high churches in Britain, uh, and they have uh, the services, there's a lot of a lot of liturgical response. It's not uh, it's not extemporaneous response like charismatic. It's in fact you got a little printed book if you're a guest, and so you know when to respond and what to say. But it's it's very much like that. And Judaism, and in the Old Testament times, there was a great deal of that. And uh, so, you know, if we say, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, yeah, and that's what a congregation in the Old Testament, they would, they would, then the, the cantor would say something. If I say, our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come. Okay, you got the point. Okay, uh, you ready? So I'm going to play something for you. Uh, I was, I, I started out reading it, but the impact of what Jesus is doing here uh, hit me so hard at the end as it probably will you when you see what Jesus is really saying that I decided that I would uh, invite 
a, a guy that I respect. Man, he's a, he, to me, he's an, he's an incredible Christian role model for me. Um, you, we may, you may not even know he's, that he is a Christian, but he's an actor named David Suchet. If you watch, he's best known for 25 years of being Hercule Poirot. <laughs> and he's got a beautiful voice. So I recorded him reading Psalm 22. Because you see, when Jesus cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? What he was crying out was like saying, our Father who art in heaven. And if you're ready, listen meaningfully to this psalm. It's long, but listen to it all the way through. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? Oh, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer, by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved, in you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, and not a man scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You Sorry. made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. That was on my side. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. 
All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, He has done it. <clears throat> That's pretty profound when you just hear it all the way through as a story, isn't it? It's not a story of, of, a, of an angry God, a judging God, turning against his son, turning his back at all. It's, you know, it's even more fascinating when, when you, uh, you know, we've always known that Psalms 22 contains the pictures, the imagery of crucifixion and of the, you know, of the uh, casting lots for clothes and things like that. I mean, that psalm was written a thousand years before this event. I mean, how did David get it so right? Especially when you take into account the fact that crucifixion was not known. It hadn't been invented, so to speak, then yet. There's no archaeological or historical indication of crucifixions taking place for another 400 years. And then the, uh, uh, I forget who it was that first uh, kind of uh, started to use that, and then quickly the Romans uh, got a hold of it and liked it, and they began to use it. Uh, and, and you know they began to use it a lot in about 300, what 300 uh, BC, which would be 600 plus years before or after that psalm was written. So uh, everything that Jesus said and did, you know, he was he was giving the he was giving the uh, the first part as a signal to those, as he did throughout his ministry linking what he was doing to a plan that spans the entire history of human beings from the from the sin in the garden until revelation 21 and all are reunited with God the Father everything that Jesus said and did was part of a focused continuous mission to fulfill the will of the Father in redeeming us from sin they were one always and never anything else this was not the only time Jesus called out Scripture to show the plan of God. Um, uh, he, you know, if, if you think back, he did it repeatedly. Thus, it is fulfilled, and he would link it to uh, a particular uh, prophecy. What he is saying throughout, and in this instance, is, "I am the direct fulfillment of these prophecies, and what is happening now is an important part of my." fulfillment of these prophecies. Uh, Romans 8.35, in terms of our oneness of God, and, and thankfully, you know, because if God, the judging God, really was that, almost, almost like uh, sin was contagion, and I, I, I can't touch it, or I can't look at it, I can't be near it, or I'm so, you know, what, what kind of a parent that was that way? <laughs> You know, I got myself a bad rap with our kids when they were real little because uh, they don't remember that I actually changed diapers because I really did. I changed those kids' diapers. I remember almost every one of them because they really did not like changing diapers. But because I didn't like changing diapers, I avoided it most of the time <laughs> by any means at my disposal. And so that's what that's what they all remember. Now we sit around the table. Yeah, Dad never changed a diaper. I did too. <laughs> you know. Well, uh, what on earth has that got to do with? It had a, a profound. <laughs> it was a profound connection here, but I but I got back in my own history and lost it. It'll come back. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, if it, so, if God were that way, um, think of what where we would be. You know, because it's in our sins that he reaches out and with his Holy Spirit begins to work with our minds and begins even then to transform us enough so that we can open our ears and hearts and listen to him. 
and come to a point of repentance and turning away from sin and accepting forgiveness and his grace and his Holy Spirit and a transformed new mind. I mean, that's, there's a whole lot of sin leading up to that. And even afterward, what about you, but there's way too much sin even with it day by day. If God really felt that way, we would not be in the privileged position that we are. And that even humanity, uh, you know, will experience. Even, even, even the, the, the worst of the worst, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, will experience the mercy, the forgiveness, the redemption of God. It, 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 just, it just didn't fit. Romans 8, 35, who then can separate us from the love of Christ? The last time I checked, there was one God, and Christ is part of the three in one. So when you're saying love of Christ, you can't not be saying love of the Spirit and love of the Father. Can, can trouble do it, or hardship, or persecution, or hunger, or poverty, or danger, or death? As the Scripture says, for, our, for your sake we are in danger of death at all times. We're treated like sheep that are going to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we have complete victory through him who said, inspired at the end of Psalm 22, I've done it. I've done it. It starts out, why have you forsaken me? I'm hanging in everybody's, everybody's deserted me and the pain is too great. And at the end, it's, no, it's not too great. And I've done it. We've done it. It is done. In all things, we have complete victory through him who, lo- who loved us. For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There's nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So rather than pleading with a God who, who won't, get his hands soiled, who's above it all, we are celebrating a carefully planned and executed rescue operation by those who love us beyond measure, who enjoy this amazing eternal dance of love and uh, life and want us to be a part of it. And they will never leave or forsake us. So let's take that through this week with us and bring it back next Sunday as we celebrate the source of our victory over death.